If you're watching this channel, it's because you don't enjoy watching the world squander what Christendom built, but you want to do your part. And chances are you've heard me mention a great means by doing just that. Email made by and for Catholics. Check out fide.email. That's F-I-D-E-I dot -E email. Built for Catholic individuals, families, organizations, and groups. They're private, secure, and of course, they're Catholic. And they're offering two months off on your first year for an annual subscription if you enter the coupon code return to tradition without spaces that's the name of this channel without spaces at checkout there are certain voices in the bergolian hierarchy that we should pay attention to when they speak because they either will tell us what's really going on inadvertently or they show us what would happen if they managed to be the person who succeeds francis to the papacy there's a short list of people that I recommend people f keeping an eye on among the Bergoglian wing of the modernists. And that would, in the past, I've brought up Cardinal Zuppi and a few others. But today, we should pay attention to Cardinal Jean-Claude Hollerick. Hollerick is one of the co-chairs of the Synod on Synodality. That's an important high-profile position in the modernist church today, in the synodal church. His job along with Cardinal Mario Gresh, is to run the Synod of Synodality. Either of those men gain a lot of prestige for doing that. They become much better known among the other cardinals. And if they do their job competently, their papability rating goes up, meaning they become more papabile, meaning they have a higher chance, higher likelihood of succeeding Francis in the papacy. That may sound like a stretch to some observers, but it was revealed in the last couple of months that along with the conservative cardinals, those who oppose Francis and just want to get back to sort of the status quo of John Paul II and Benedict XVI, along with them preparing for the next conclave, it came out that the modernist wing was also preparing for the next conclave, and that they were seeking a Francis II except somebody who was probably a little more charismatic than Francis, someone who actually knows how to bite their tongue, but also, and most importantly, more importantly than being liked by people, they wanted somebody who would be easily controlled by Francis' supporters. A pope who wouldn't occasionally go and throw a bone to the traditionalists or the conservatives, but somebody who could be controlled, who would not try to stop them from their excesses. In a word, somebody who would be potentially worse than Francis, because at least once in a while, Francis drops the hammer on people who are on his, allegedly his side of things when they cause problems. Hollerick would probably fit the bill of a weaker potential follow-up for Francis from that side of things. He's not the only one, but he's somebody whose name has to be in those conversations. We also know, by the way, that these cardinals, the Bergoglian cardinals, are meeting and have met in St. Gallen, Switzerland again. That should raise some eyebrows. But let's actually focus on Cardinal Hollerick here. He has publicly been speaking recently about, you guessed it, fiducia supplicants and other issues related to the sins of the flesh and Catholic morality. And he signaled to the Bergoglian wing that he is fully in support of the things Francis is doing and thinks that we should rethink Catholic morality, especially for priests. So our headline comes from LifeSite News with this reassuring headline. Cardinal Hollerick voices support for blessings of double S couples, questions priestly celibacy. I am absolutely on the same line as the Pope on blessing double S couples. Cardinal Jean-Claude Hollerick said, adding, why only care about below the belt morality? So, of course, obviously no one only cares about below the belt morality. There are plenty of other things we care about. It's just that this is what's being talked about right now. and has been since just before Christmas. Prior to that, what we were talking about was Francis crushing good bishops who were voicing opposition to him. You remember now, it seems like an eternity ago, when Bishop Strickland was canceled by Rome? That's what we were talking about for a solid two months. It was Bishop Strickland, what he was going to do, and then suddenly it was Cardinal Burke, and a few others. That was what we were talking about. Now, it's just an endless talk about morality, purity, or in this case, impurity and our standards for how clergy should behave, and what the standards were for the laity. Fiducia supplicants has had an interesting cascading effect, because if that sin, that's such so the focus of our discourse, the one that cries out to heaven for justice, if the church's teaching on that can be changed, 
then Humanae Vitae is up for grabs. The uh, anything, anything related to the sins of the flesh are up for grabs if they can make that one acceptable in practice, which is what they did with fiducia supplicants, or at least it's what they've tried to do. I am confident that that document will eventually be rescinded by a future pope, if should we get one who is actually decent anytime soon. But Cardinal Hollerich makes his case for this imposition of heresy on the church. Quote, Papal confidant Cardinal Jean-Claude Hollerich, Archbishop of Luxembourg, has voiced his support for the heterodox blessings of double S types proposed by the Vatican's December Declaration Fiducia Supplicants. In an interview with Les Sensiel, Hollerich was asked about the mounting criticisms Pope Francis is facing for his approval of such blessings from bishops and bishops' conferences, an approval he has doubled down on in recent weeks. The Cardinal, who himself has publicly called to change Catholic teaching on the James Martin subject, replied that he completely agrees with Pope Francis on the matter of blessings. I am absolutely on the same line as the Pope, Hollerich said. Following a rec recently voiced causistic line of reasoning, he continued, would we deny the blessings to a James Martin pairing because they are sinners and we would bless an entrepreneur who is going to invest against humanity? This is hypocritical. The Pope considers himself a sinner and so do I, Hollerich touted, failing to distinguish between mortal and venial sin and implying that sinners in any way, in any situation, can be blessed regardless of circumstances. He added, the Pope does not like to condemn the sins of others without looking at his own. Then, appearing to downplay Catholic morality of the flesh, which teaches that all uh, acts of the flesh outside of holy matrimony are gravely sinful, Hollerich retorted, Why only a care about the below-the-belt morality? <laughs> End quote. Sure, there are other issues to address. The selling out of the church to the secular authorities. You know, back in 2019, the uh, Pan-Amazon Synod, a lot of people focused at at that time on the Pacamama debacle for good reason. I mean, idolatry in the temple of God is a pretty big deal. But they also focused on this very Provati thing, this idea that older married men whose children have grown can become ordained priests in these extreme circumstances, which doesn't really appear to have gone anywhere, at least yet. And a few other things. But, you know, the Pan Amazon Synod was a the case study in the church trying to make itself closer to secular government institutions. The church was being sold out to them at the Pan-Amazon Synod and had been for years beforehand. I mean, the Vatican, prior to the events of 2020, seemed like every year was hosting a conference or two for various non-governmental and governmental organizations that had nothing to do with Catholicism, who were often headed by people and participants at these conferences were overtly hostile to Catholicism. That was the status quo. The events of 2020 seem to have changed that, but don't worry, I'm sure they'll get back to those conferences soon enough. We'd be talking about those things if they were what the church was involved, the man allegedly running the church was doing to the church at the time. But instead, we're taught, forced to talk about fiducia supplicants and Catholic morality of the flesh because that's what's relevant to the discussion right now. Now, as for this other absurd thing he says there, remember, Francis loves to hit people with this, if I give a blessing to an entrepreneur who does, who, whose business practices might harm some people, then I, nobody says anything, but if I offer a blessing to James Martin types, I get criticized. That stuff, they're not the same thing. They're not. And honestly, if he was giving blessings to a, a real life, I don't know, Tony Stark kind of figure, yeah, people would criticize him probably for that. But he already does that. All you have to do is go look at some of these these elites he has over at the Vatican, at his conferences. He already does that, and people do criticize him for it. It's just that people get accused of wearing a hat made of aluminum foil when he does that, or when we criticize him for it. And the reasoning for his doing this, this conflating of the two, is because he's trying to make it seem ridiculous to criticize him for blessing public unrepentant sinners because that's the core of this we have a long history of critiquing him for that i mean his friendship with uh, eugenio scalfari the late eugenio scalfari the man who went to his went to his judgment without like publicly professing to not believe in in god that francis had personal fr had a personal friendship with and i pray that francis managed to convince him to uh, to leave that belief system behind but i I doubt that that happened, but I do hope that that did happen. 
we criticized him for that. We've criticized him for rubbing shoulders with political elites who clearly have animosity towards the church, including his appointment to some of these of these people to key positions in Vatican dicasteries that stand in clear opposition to what those dicasteries are supposed to be about. John Paul's Second Academy for Life being one of them, the most obvious example of this. So yes, we criticize him for that too. It's just that people tend to forget about those things because the James Martin sin is just so in your face in the culture now that we are forced to talk about this constantly. Let's get back to this. So this is where he gets to the one thing that a lot of people in the audience will probably agree with. You see, if you believe that the Ted McCarrick problem or vocations among the priesthood will be taken care of by getting rid of clerical clerical celibacy, well, don't worry. These obsessed and pure-minded clerics are with you on that subject. And I will remind you that the Ted McCarrick problem, the number one place in the world where you're going to find that outside the church, the number one place in anything is in the home. In a place where the activities of the flesh are permitted normally in the bonds of sacramental matrimony. But it still happens there. That's the number one place. And the number two place are in public education institutions. Again, a place where celibacy doesn't come up. Where there is no restriction on people's behavior in that way as long as they're not doing it at the place they work at with people they shouldn't be doing those things with. And the third place this comes up, more than in Catholic places, are Protestant schools. Or not, in Protestant churches. These are places run by married ministers. That is where this happens the most. It doesn't solve the problem. And as for vocations, there's no evidence that it will take care of the vocations problem. None whatsoever. Theologians have gone over this numerous times. Hallrick doesn't care about that, though. Here, he just uh, talks about wanting to change Catholic morality. Quote, Asked further whether the church needs to evolve in her moral teachings, the Luxembourg Cardinal praised the moral changes of the day and questioned the necessity of things like priestly celibacy, saying, Some priests found it hard. Our apocal change is phenomenal, and the church needs to understand, be understood by the people, he said. Many bishops ask themselves the question of the marriage of priests, for example. Asked his own thoughts on the matter, he replied, Yes, I am wondering. Some priests have a hard time being celibate. Claiming that a lifting of the obligation of priestly celibacy would help alleviate the growing crisis of vocations in Europe, he continued, Giving them a choice would allow them to have a few more people ready for the priesthood. In Europe, this few can make a difference. Hollerick himself is known for his public support of the James Martin movement. In 2022, he described as false the church's denouncement of such activities as sinful. He added that there are, quote, James Martin types among my priests in his archdiocese of Luxembourg. I have such women and men among the laity, he added, and they know they have a home in the church. Hollerick called for a change in church teaching on that sin, which comes on top of his openness to ordaining women to the sacred priesthood and opening holy orders to married men. In August 2022, Hollerick then claimed that his thoughts on the James Martin sin were in full agreement with Pope Francis, but only weeks later he told LifeSite News that, quote, I am not in favor of changing any doctrine. Instead, he said he was in favor of a church in which everybody can feel welcome, end quote. He probably got a talking to about being saying that he saying all that stuff and then saying that he was in full agreement with Francis on those things, thus imply that Francis was in agreement with that, too probably got a talking to about that in the same way that several months ago it was reported that the vatican is getting ready to change the rules of the conclave to elect the next roman pontiff to make laity in in the room during the actual debates among the college of cardinals and according to some of those reports actually active participants in the voting itself for the next pontiff the cardinal who was said to be doing those things publicly said, no, that's not true. And then literally the next day had a private meeting with Francis that was on the agenda. Probably got a talking to. We don't know if that means either of those things are true, but we'll find out. I'm curious what you think about this though. Are you surprised that a, a person who quite possibly may be a front runner to be the next Roman pontiff is so open to just continuing the work of Francis and being more blatant about it? including how he offers blessings in his diocese to people he probably shouldn't be, public unrepentant sinners. Again, this is not about necessarily their particular sins, other than the fact that these prelates have a weird focus and fascination on them. This has more to do with them being public unrepentant sinners. 
and that the church offering them blessings. The key word here is unrepentant and public. Remember, we are all called to repent of our sins. It doesn't matter so much that if we repent of the sins and we fail to live up to that repentance and have to keep making use of the sacrament of penance over and over again to get past that sinful inclination of ours. Because at least we are acknowledging our sinful nature and relying on the church to give us the graces necessary to eventually overcome. This is the lack of repentance and the lack of seeing the sins themselves as sins. And coming from a senior prelate of the church, that should be very concerning to everybody. But again, I'm curious what you have to say about this. Let me know in the comments, please. And hit like and subscribe if you haven't. It does help. So to sharing this on social media, that helps too. And as always, pray for the church. I'm Anthony Stein. Ave Maria.